ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Sri Lankan Alcott Schools alumni in the Gandhi Rapid Rates, I would warmly welcome you all to the inaugural Alcott Audition here in the flag of all Buddhist traditions. Ladies and gentlemen, although Alcott Audition is an annual event in Sri Lanka organized by their all Old Boys Association of Ananda College. For the first time here in the UAE, this all great oration is being organized today in honor of Colonel Henry Steele Alcott on the topic of alternative medicine and spirituality as tools for stress management and enhancing individual performance. Stress producers, Dr. Imala Mansa is a clean clinician scientist, a faculty member, medical educator for 38 years, a world-renowned expert in endocrinology, osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease and vitamin D and nutrition. Dr. Vimala Vansan, it is indeed a great honor to have you with us as the speaker of this inaugural World Adoration. To name a few affiliations of our renowned speaker, founder, executive president, International Foundation for Revitalization, Empowerment and Education and Development, founder president, Hilla Bodhupadanama in North America, president, Vimalavansa Foundation, which helps those who are in need, including introducing action plan to eradicate chronic disease chronic kidney disease from north central province of Sri Lanka. Dr. Himanavasa holds several academic credentials including three doctorates, Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Science. Surprisingly, Colonel Olgert was born in New Jersey, USA and arrived in Sri Lanka for the first time from the Goa port and Dr. Vimalavansa was born in Gaul and currently based in New Jersey, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, I should not take much of your time. Please join with me in warmly welcoming our eminent speaker of the inaugural All Catoration, also a remarkable old Anandia, Dr. Vimalavansa, Dr. Sunil Vimalavansa. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and uh, address this distinguished audience. And uh, really need a working day, and I really appreciate your presence in this, moment, uh, in this evening. So, the topic I was asked to give is kind of very broad, but I'm going to cover several areas. Prior to that, let me very briefly go through the work. It's something complementary to the secretary was mentioning about. So, we have a history even going back before Colonel Lorca to set the stage for the so-called Buddhist revival in Sri Lanka. So these are the key pillars, some of the key really people who helped to stage the uh, scene for Colonel Lorca to do what he did for us today. I submit you that actually none of you will be here today if Colonel Lorca didn't go to Sri Lanka because he actually initiated most of the schools and uh, school like Anand and Al, that then subsequently provided teachers to other school like St. Thomas and Royal and Thing. 80% of the teachers actually generated from Anand. So in the absence of Kandor, that wouldn't have happened. So all of you, I, I trust that you'll be here because of, at least in part of, due to him. So you already heard that he's a great, uh, the, Revival person behind us as uh, the other complimentary thing, and he's the guy who really got to wake up as an international holiday going back more than 140 years ago. So, you already heard that he designed the international Buddhist flag, which accepted the United Nations and multiple countries, and he also established two other key things like Mahabodhi Society. Geophysical Society of New Jersey, uh, so New York as well as back in Sri Lanka in 19, 18, 1892, I think, that was. 
So here's a summary of what he did, uh, his visionary for us, for the future. So within the first 12 years, he managed to create 400 schools in the country. Similarly, technically Buddhist school, but there's no restriction for anybody else to get into these schools either. So imagine nowadays, <coughs> this year, the constructing 400 new schools back in Sri Lanka, it's not going to happen. But this guy had a vision of doing that, but he was supported by the bunch of very good people to make that happen. So we already heard that some of these schools uh, was originated through his, his foundation. <coughs> and there are a lot more schools than this list. And he had a vision for the future. He, he knew that he was thinking about 50 years ahead what the country should look, look like. So that's what we really persuaded him to do for the country. And as a good Buddhist, he really has, uh, he did things without expecting anything returned back to him. That's kind of a motto of uh, Buddhism to start with. So, have you said that he start to the topic of, oops, topic of today, which is alternative medicine, or oh, generally the, the how we could use the spirituality and meditation to improve our lifestyles and hopefully I was hoping that there were some children here but uh, education as well as the, uh, the work performance so that you can be proud of what you're doing more than even doing today. So well, the object of the presentation is to understand that there's a role of other things and other than we've taken for granted of what we're doing today to alleviate the stress and improve our performance and uh, make your life our life still happier than what it could be. Because all of us living in a fairly stressful environment, you know, being very stressful, somewhere in the middle, and uh, we come to that and so we need a certain degree of stress to work efficiently. But if that level increases more than what you could handle or what you could adapt to, that's where the problem starts. So, these are the four areas I'm going to briefly cover during the next hour or so. So, how, so what, what is health basically? Health is basically not a health alone, it's a combination of our emotional health, mental health, which is not the same as emotional health, together with the physical health. To have a healthy life, you need to have a healthful mind and healthy body. It has to go together. It doesn't, you cannot separate the mind from the body to become happier and prosperous and leading a good life. So, in the absence of any of those, in the mental health or physical health, you clearly going to have a abnormal stresses going to build up in your lifestyle. So, sometimes it's unavoidable. Then what you need to do actually to develop your own methods, own techniques to handle the stress in a beneficial way so that rather than succumbing to the stress, you have to use that stress to advantage for you. It can be done on an individual basis. You need to develop your own technique of doing that. So let's start with the lifestyle issues which can or which will should affect our health. To start with, activity. We used to be much more active than today because we have had cars, we drive right to the supermarket, we walk less, doesn't take the stairs, we take the elevators, we take all the shortcuts so that we have less exercise. So as a consequence, as you know, the type 2 diabetes as well as obesity, people's abdominal obesity is dramatically increasing throughout the world. And the rate of increase of these two type 2 diabetes and obesity is the highest in Southeast Asia. Sri Lanka is no exception. For example, if I tell you that uh, instead of diabetes, so prevalence of diabetes used to be about 11, 12 percent, but 15, 20 years ago, now close to 20 plus. In fact, some cities, like I saw a report uh, last week, in Goa is about 33 percent. Unbelievable. So what that means, one in three people living in the Goa city is now diabetic. Never heard of it before. So, Part of that actually is the lifestyle change that we have taken shortcuts. Traditional food we used to, Melbourne, but Paripu, it is in and I would drive to some uh, take, take away. 
both adds to the issue. Together with that, I strongly believe that uh, the stress, whether due to family or the workplace or economic, is really also pushing to the <coughs> negativity to this area. Then, of course, the other bad habits of people adapting, uh, time, peer pressure, smoking, alcohol, drugs, whatever, big list of things, which clearly going to affect your performance and happiness and your end of the age health. So, there's an area that should be addressed by individual as well. As. The last area is actually the emotional health, which I already briefly mentioned that because that directly related to your physiology or can lead to pathology, time needed to be a disorder. So emotional health you cannot separate from the physical health either. Question is how can you improve emotional health? I'll give some clues a little bit very briefly how simple way of overcoming that kind of difficulty. So behavior is a, is a problem. So this is see what's a modifiable behavior on 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 our on to improve our lifestyle. So <coughs> These so are some of the simple things you can see. The first is nutrition, we already went through very briefly. Then the lack of exercise. When I say weight bearing exercise, it's not weightlifting. It's not going to a gym and pay money and uh, spend two hours. It's just walking, fast walking. Uh, walking is the best exercise anybody can get. You don't have to run 10 miles a day or 10 miles a week. That's, we're not designed to do that as a human being. Of course you can do it, you can train. I used I have done several full marathons myself. I was stupid those days. I didn't know that. It's not physical. I would do now. So human beings are not designed to run long distance like that. We are designed by the evolution to run short distance under gathering you catch up with the eat and you have see you for the next day or two. So our muscular system, bones, and the genes are designed to short bouts of exercise, which generally is beneficial if it lasts about one or two days, single 10 minutes exercise. So physiologically, if you look at it, you can exercise 10, 15 minutes a day. Again, what I'm talking about is fast working. There's something that's very simple, climbing stairs. The beneficial effects last one to three days. So you don't have to go to gym and spend two, several hours and some people doing that. Then again, there is no brain of that too. There are bad habits you need to stop it. Smoking, for example, alcohol. All these are harmful on the long term, long term basis. So, the mind is the one to control us. Mind can control anything. So, mind control our activity, our thought process. It can make us peaceful, or it can make us feel bad people or stressful people. So, you uh, can historically any leaders and any dictator, uh, just take a Hitler for example, he had a brilliant mind, but that mind was designed to destru destruction. So, similarly, people who develop the atomic bomb, they are brilliant scientists, but it was directed to destruction rather than to construction. So, mind controls everything in a good way or bad way. Similarly, this, I talk about calorie intake. So, mind control what we should eat, but we should not eat. <coughs> Temptation is one really breaking the line. So I'm not going to read any of these lines, it's a self-explanatory and you should be able to see that. But these are some of the modifiable behaviors. Some are very simple. You will really change your lifestyle, it can make a big difference on the outcome on the longer term basis. May not be for the week or two, but certainly in the six months, one year, two year basis, your life can be much better if you change a little bit of 10% here, 10% there, any of these activities. So, we we'll come to that, the last item, people know this, depending on the good doctors and getting prescription for controlling their stress, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. The antidepressant, for example, it does not even address the fundamental root causes of depression. It just temporarily changing your the chemicals in your brain and so hopefully some people you know, 50 percent will feel better other people can get nothing but people who make this drug make billions so you when you more they take more more and more the people get people uh, companies get richer and richer so we are really not addressing the fundamental issue of stress or the depression 
So some of these we have already dealt with. Then the behavioral modification also has other components, including the prevention of uh, medical disorders like obesity, diabetes, hypertension. All this can be preventable by simply changing your lifestyle. So why spending billions of dollars to take drugs to fix these things where you can do yourself proactively now, today? So if you're going to develop osteoporosis in 10 years, 15 years, you do the exercise and take balanced diet, stop smoking, you may never get it. Yet, we wait till to get this disorder to appear in the diabetes and then struggle to try and control it, which is probably the wrong way to do that. So, again, what matters is, is a determination of our mind to put it right, right direction, at the right time, to overcome the negative components we see, the TV advertisements all the time, particularly the children, and we get the temptation of the latest thing they have on the latest side. iPhone, <coughs> oh, iPhone 4 works as good as iPhone 6. Why have you changed? Just because your neighbor has it or your friend has it? That's a temptation. It's a spurious or a false sense of competition which is really destroying our relationships, friendships, partnerships, and the economy of the individual families because we don't need that. So, just a note about the planning of the day to activity because this is a common question people ask me quite often. How can you do 10 different things in a given day? Yes, you can. You might manage your time efficiently. You plan, your, you plan it the day, the morning, or the night before, whatever you do. But the key is to have, to have a flexibility of your plan. If you have a rigid plan, what happens is if A doesn't work, you're going to forget about the B, C, and D, then you will really end up with stress. Whereas if there isn't one thing whatsoever, you should be able to flexible to move to the next one, next one, and do it, and come back to what you did before. In other words, psychologically, you should be able to flexible to go your family issue, the person issue, as well as your your business issue, your workforce <coughs> at the same time. So the way I look at it, if you if you if you plan each minute what you're going to do in the day, you actually save over ten times of the time of your productivity. So imagine that you have to plan every hour one minute or ten minutes of the day, you could see about the hour and a half of your time of how efficient you're going to accomplish the given task at any given time. So stress is inevitable. So therefore this, uh, you need to develop your own ways of dealing with the stress. Everybody is different. Your way of stress is different from the one you are sitting next to. Some people stress is other person's nothing. That's normal. So in other words, stress is very, very relative term. Your stress is not my stress. I don't care. Whereas something else with my stress may be nothing for you guys. So you see that it's, it's a, when you say I'm stressed, to me it's nothing. I don't know what stress or it's a very, very relative term that people are using so loosely. <coughs> So what, what are you doing? What do you do? Think about what you do when you are stressed. I want you to think positively in addition to reading. What do you do? Imagine the, the, the time you were really stressed last week, maybe last month. What have you done? Then think about what you have done to overcome it. How did you manage to overcome it? So did you manage or did you fail to do that? Simple thing, if you think back, think backwards and see the, particular stress and what, why it happened, how you dealt with The next time when you get a similar stress, you know how better to handle it because you know what causes the stress. I'll show you the next time. You are talking about the root cause of that particular type of stress. And if you know that, then either you can avoid it or this unavoidable stress, which is, for example, at work, place of there are unavoidable stresses. Then, those things, then you know, you should be able to, you should be able to uh, overcome by, by, uh, by adapting to your own, own method of delivering weight. So these are the, some of the things you do generally or when you are stressed. Many of these items are really automatic. You won't think about it. You go and eat. You can drink. You can you go and smoke. Do something automatically because that's what you end up to do. But many of these things are not the right thing to do 
in some ways for the stress. Whereas, you said the things you think about should do when you come up with a stressful situation next time. Think about it. Again, I want to think about the next minute or so of how can you adapt this list. I mean, this is a very short list, but I can give you 20 different things. But these are the simple things you should adapt, particularly the children can tell them to adapt these things to when they come across the stress, which is not beneficial for them. So again, to add to that list, there are things you can develop on your own. Again, very difficult to prescribe things like that because people's different stresses are different, people behave stress in a different ways. So you have to do your own way of relaxation to overcome some of the critical aspects of the stress rather than reacting to the stress. So if you develop slowly some technique, you should be able to handle it rather than reacting proactively so that, that if you don't get the stress, you just fly through the stress and you are feeling it, feeling stress because you cannot avoid the stress all the time. The stress is there, you okay? you got a multiple assignment, you are doing so 10 days you are doing 24 hours, so what? These things come and go sometimes. So if you know the, the rationale behind it, then you should be able to handle them less stressfully but more efficiently. So there are several things you can do. And the, one of the key things for accumulation of the stress is, is a, have a personal conflict or anonymous with your workplace, family, your friends, or whatever. On the other hand, if you learn to, easy to say, but if you learn to know how to forgive other people's mistakes, it's a big step towards alleviation of uh, individual stress, rather than building up your own mind and getting your blood pressure up, having diabetes, and obese, and go and smoke. It's just very good. Most of the time, we, we, we fight against uh, what I call the small potatoes, small things, which we dwell into the big things later because we're not willing to let it go. Think about again your situation of last month, one or two things. I mean, if you don't tell me that you didn't have that, I'll be surprised. Everybody goes through this kind of thing. You should be stressed up for nothing, for such a simple thing. But if you don't give up the inability to forgive, those are going to get accumulated, come culminate, and then you're going to start fighting, quarreling, writing bad emails, and all this stuff comes as a that comes Again, in addition, there are other things like uh, engaging some type of spiritual activity. No matter what you do, no matter what religion you are, every religion has a spiritual component. So, use that as your advantage, not as a slave for the religion, but continue, con turn it right to your advantage and use that principles to clean up your mind and uh, help to get over with some of these issues. So the goals, simple goals are really in life to identify the cause and elevation of those root cause analysis in your own case of stressors. It could be one, it could be more than one, depending on the circumstances and where you work and what kind of relationship you have. End of the day, what you look important is for you need to stay healthy, both mentally, emotionally, and physically. If you don't have the health, there's no wealth. What's the point of having the wealth if you don't have the health? Right? It doesn't grow like that. You can make millionaires, and a lot of millionaires are really sick, either mentally or physically. So they cannot even enjoy their lot of earnings necessarily. So change your high stress to a low stress by adapting the stressful situation for your environment. How you do that is an individual basis. So you need to develop your own way of doing that, but it's very effective to do that stressful situation, change it to a less stressful situation by you psychologically adapting the situation. So that clearly leave your mind before peacefully, therefore your performance has to go up. I mean, there's no question about it. There are several small studies have done based on this concept and show that productivity goes up anything from 20 to almost 50 percent individual basis. So imagine that you all are working in one company and your productivity goes up by 30 percent. Your, your boss will be happy, your company portfolio so I already said that uh, there's a mind and a body and not separate no matter what Pandit says. They all are very tightly connected. The mind is safe, the body is safe, the body is safe, the mind is safe. 
So both has to be improved simultaneously and it can be done in many circumstances. So healthy mind is healthy body, you know, question the body. So you need to have both goes together. So let's talk about uh, stress itself. What is stress? What do you think is stress? Think about it. As I said, the stress from one person is very different from the stress from another person. So, stress is really in your mind. Not, nothing to do with it. I cannot cause you stress unless you take it granted as a stress. If I try to cause you stress, for example, you just ignore it. You're fine. You're not going to get stressed. I'm the one who's going to get stressed. Right? If you get into your brain and you try to get your blood pressure up and you try to react, who's going to lose? Not me, you are going to lose it. So you are the one who now getting stressed for unnecessarily because you took it for people, but personally. So that's another area one could gradually develop, not to get to person and somebody's calling at you or hit you or somebody in trouble or write bad things about you. Who okay. cares? So if you learn to dampen down your ego and uh, let go a little bit, that could have major beneficial effects on the longer term. As I said before, though, when the mind is stressed, your body is automatically going to get stressed no matter what. We'll come back to that uh, in a little while on a, on a medical point of view. So stress is really not a bad thing. We, we need to have a certain stress to behave properly and uh, improve our productivity. Imagine you work in a corporation and you take it completely free and you uh, Whatever you go say, you don't do it. You'll be fired. So, and you, you cannot work on that situation. You have to be flexible, and a certain amount of stress is necessary for studies for children as well as the work performance. Problem starts with when that level becomes intolerable, or if you don't know how to handle that reasonable amount of stress. Then you have to develop your own techniques to handle that. So, again, a certain amount of stress is normal and most setups you need it for us to function properly. And when it's excess, you see the certain threshold on an individual basis, that's where the problem starts. So why do I need to manage the stress? So unmanaged stress is clearly harmful, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. It, it drains you down, no question about it. If you drain you down, you cannot aspect productivity to go on. Yeah. So you will become a less productive person for family, or your organization, or your network course, which is bad for you. So this, this, oops. So this is what happened to the most people in the Western society. Look at the time scale and so wake up in the morning, <coughs> busy time, There's hardly any time for to spend with the kids, trying to schools, back to work. <coughs> so because of the time strain, time constraint, you don't even take your lunch back to work now, like we used to do, we jump food, whatever the easy thing to do. So you're accumulating more unhelpful <laughs> food in addition to the stress. <laughs> so by the time the, to the end of the day you are really stressed out. So you're bringing now work stress back home, which is totally unnecessary. Because your behavior is going to be now different from the normal behavior. <coughs> so it's very unusual, some stressful families who are going to sit down and together anymore because they're all stressed out and that is somewhere among with some uh, kids who are on their own and everybody's stressed out to the end of the day. So this is a kind of negative vicious cycle we, particularly the Western society, building up and causing a lot more issues including high blood pressures, obesity, cancer. It's really related to stress, no question at all. A lot of data show that Stressful life will lead to various types of cancer. 
So that's the reason we need to able to develop the own ways of managing stress because some of the circumstances you saw day to day life we may not be able to avoid it. So what we are facing, but we don't take that stress on full blown. We need to learn to how to dampen it down to <coughs> to do that partly by relieving stress or avoiding certain certain circumstances. Having said that, most of us, including me, we create stress for ourselves because we, we accept things which we cannot complete. So, what you call that, you, you bite more than what you can chew. So, if you have a multiple tasks you accept and then you can finish it, right in your mentality, you're always frustrated. You, you, you negative thinking will go to build up, and the stress level will go up sky high. <coughs> Again, who goes here that you're accepting things you cannot do? So it's perfectly okay to learn to say no, family, friends, society, go in and work. Not to get fired from the work, but then you should be able to learn, know your limit of tasks you can do. If you can do only two tasks and you will put only the four tasks, you will be stressed out and your work for home will be less, the quality of the output will be less. So who's going to suffer? Not the boss. You're going to suffer. But they said, oh, this guy's it doesn't do the job well. Not that he can't do the job well, he'll put on too many things he cannot handle. But who, the person responsible is you, writing me, accepting, and not saying no and appropriating. Second area is a lot of people get into trouble is finances. So spending with the plastic cards, the money which you've never had, you don't have, then you end up with the multiple debt. Multiple credit cards when you will take to continue to go up. <coughs> so this again, if you think sensibly, it's an area very easy to fix it. You know what you're doing. And this area, you essential that you need to teach and expose your children before they get into this death cycle and get into major processes. The key is actually to when you get stress, how to turn that into this positive for you. Instead of a negative vicious cycle, you creating that positive cycle of stress management and breaking that negative which is cycle of stress. So this uh, photo from us uh, in Switzerland, so it really shows what's happening. This is not artificial actually, it's in the bus, real bus. So, so that summarizes what the stress can do to you. You expose yourself to suicide and the family breakdown. To analyze the root cause, sometimes it's some very trivial things started all these problems for this individual basis. <clears throat> so, unmanaged stress can lead to multiple disorders, no question about it, including the cancer. In addition, you create enemies because you behave badly. Not voluntary, but you unconsciously behave badly, so you create enemies, start shouting, families, family disruption, <coughs> and many things are going to happen, including the disabilities and premature death due to poor stress. So, if you start the day like this and end up the day five o'clock like this, there's something wrong with your lifestyle management. So, perhaps you need to develop your own techniques of uh, inducing that unmanageable stress to a manageable style. How you do that to the technique is up to you. People go and play sports, uh, go for a walk, jog, meditation, it doesn't matter what, what you do. It's an individual basis. That's what I said, it's very difficult to prescribe the global that we do this one, we're going to create the stress. It doesn't apply. Stress is different from person to person. Personalities are different. So, time time we need to laugh. Yeah, Perfectly all right to laugh loudly and enjoy with the, the company, whatever the company, uh, particularly the family, family circumstances. So, what we also need to learn or we need to teach our students, uh, our children, is actually to learn to be contained of what they have. As I said in the previous example from iPhone 5, the children is asking our, I mean, that is buying the iPhone 6. Don't give it, and that's such a stupid thing. Because the more you give, they don't know how to balance their life. You actually learn putting them with them, they're trading them into the bad vicious cycle of uh, economic non-understanding, competition, or 
competing with his peers. Said, oh, my, my friend has it, therefore I need to have it. So you're really the breaking the principle, basic principle, Buddhist principle of non the teaching non containable for children when doing that living level. So think about it. before you buy something just to a your son or daughter is asking you. So you may be doing the wrong thing by buying something in gadget for <coughs> your children. So the principles also include that as I said before, think about what happened today, last week or week before. What causes that stress to you? It's really you upset so much. So again, think course. In business it's called root cause analysis. It's the same thing in life. Nothing fancy about it. And then develop the thinking of positive attitude, that particular stress, and think how you can dampen it down or eliminate it altogether. You can avoid it, avoid it. But sometimes, as I said, at workplace it's very difficult to avoid it. So you need to deal with it in a different way. Some people like to do yoga, tai chi, meditation. It's fine. You find a way what you like to do, what you enjoy to do, to overcome that stressful situation so that you can dampen down the level of stress from unmanageable to manageable level of stress. Again, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of healthful lifestyle and healthy food and its influence on your mind and, and body. So, we all need reliable friends. Friends can be helpful. At the same time, non-reliables can be very helpful to anybody's life. Some people end up in jail just because they are associated with their unfaithful friends. So, overall, the trend in the West, particularly to stress, is to go to a doctor and get a prescription for antidepressants or something chemically, chemical. It doesn't address anything. It's like a having a cigarette for 10 minutes satisfaction. What happened after that? You're back to the square one. So, or you're addicted to it, you're going to have a, become a chain smoker. Say that you start with one glass of alcohol and a uh, month later you need two glasses. Six months later you need the whole bottle to satisfy your, 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 your stress levels. So these are not the answers to combat stress or anything here. All this negative vicious cycle, eventually you will go down the drain and perhaps prematurely due to bad behavior. So learning to manage the stress in usual basis is the most important thing. So this slide is basically summarize why we should not rely on Western medicine or any medicine for that matter to relieve your stress. It's the wrong thing to do and you're never going to get achieve the goal that you're uh, going to. Particularly the things like stimulants if you get to use tobacco, coffee, tea, uh, whatever to relieve the stress temporary basis, you're going to get depending on that kind of stimulant maintain your lifestyle. That's that's how the addiction starts. When it's addiction to alcohol, drugs, smoking, it's the same thing. Part of the brain pushing the addiction is identical. It's exactly the same place. No matter what drug you use, no matter what alcohol you use, no matter what <coughs> bad things you do, the addiction part of the brain is exactly the same. Same chemicals will create the addiction and maintain the addiction. So when you're treating the addiction, it doesn't matter what addiction you are, the treatment is the same basically in addition to psychological, psychotherapy component. The point here actually to you is that no medicine can reverse your stress helpful. So the degrees of averaging the stress, you have to develop that on your own, own style. So let's now look at the effect of stress on our health. A little bit more details of what would excessive or unmanageable stress do to you. Firstly, the health is defined by the WHO or any definition you can look at it. Is the state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. It's not one part of it. It's a complete entire capsule of the whole thing, whole body. So 
So in the absence of any of these physical, mental or social well-being, you can only consider yourself as a healthy person. You may be doing lifting 400 pounds, you're a muscular man, but if you don't have the mental health or social well-being, how can you call yourself a healthy person? It doesn't work like that. You have to have a balanced life if the whole goes together. So these are the two contrasts, when you're healthy, when you're left, and if you're not healthy, suffering and disease process progress. So, eastern part of the world, the understanding that good health is a balance between the body and mind, so called Chinese called yin and yang, it's the same, same principle basically. So mind body contract uh, the connection, so one is connected to the other, so we need to con control both or improve the health of both to become really healthy and happy person. So similarly, life and the environment also interaction. So to have a healthy life and a healthy environment, if you live in a city with, a, you can't see with the smoke all the time, I, I wouldn't be healthy, you can travel, right? Like in Chinese city, for example, sometimes you go there, you can't even see them. You cannot even send more than 15 people. So much of smoke. The people are dying of being infected by inhaling all these chemicals. So, environment is critically important and secondly, more important actually to people think that they can damage the environment and uh, disrupt it and get away with it. Never. Mm -hmm. Damage the environment, they always come back with it. They always cause human and animal diseases. That's exactly what happened back in Sri Lanka. I think that you mentioned about a chronic kidney disease in Sri Lanka. And that's because we, as a collective, particularly farmers, are damaging our environment big time. So you can't expect the environment to not to react to that kind of the human health issues. I have seen personally you know, in, in injecting, uh, spraying uh, all nasty chemicals, all this stuff, and throwing the empty can into the stream. Look at 10 minutes later, all the fish in that area will be dead, and the people down the stream drinking that water. So who is causing the problems? Farmers themselves. So not only the farmers, the companies doing the same thing, people who are selling this agrochemical do the same thing. So as a government, we encourage them to do the same thing. Because we do not think the long-term benefits of preservation of our environment. So, so I'm going to re-emphasize that the good mental health is important for good physical health as well. So we have a healthy balanced diet some kind of relaxation, exercise, yoga, tai chi, sports, together with the uh, helpful medical issues like the supplements and the meditation can lead to beneficial things on the longer term. And medications is the last step, should be the last step in our, our ability to adapt to the social circumstances. So when you are stressed, there are multiple things happen on the physiological and pathophysiological in our bodies, including that we have anxiety, fear, depression, anger, sadness, whole, whole bunch of this. So it also translates into the physiological, it break down the physiological balance in our virtual every system in the body. People need to have uh, gastric acidity, gastric ulcers, and bleeding, chest pains, strokes, any problems, you name anything can happen as a consequence of unmanageable stress. Again, when you, when you think about it in the Western medicine, what we do, what I do, or I did, he said, holding the tiger's tail, trying to retreat this is absolutely useless. Honestly. We are not addressing the why this person developed gastric ulcers. So gastric ulcers are due to stress. What's the point of treating the ulcers itself rather than educating that person to elevation of the stress because if you treat it, it will come back again three to six months. You see my point? You have addressed a fundamental issue of imbalanced physiology, what we call it pathology, correcting back to the physiology by changing the lifestyle. Because almost 70% of the diseases today is due to some kind of lifestyle, lifestyle issue, so the stress. So treating this part with the medication and which the pharmaceutical companies are not the right answer for treating properly on an individual basis for anybody. But 
in Western medicine, that's what we train. Right? If you go to the medical school, we teach them, or oh, use that drug, use this drug, and you're fine. But we never combine or educate the, the, the training doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. But the more important part of that, which is the psychological part of them to handle that, that better. Is that prevention is better than the cure? So, but we are addressing, we are not addressing this component at all, except that it's 20%, 30% on your right side of the screen, and that's why we're spending billions and trillions of dollars in the trade, which in my opinion is really a waste of money and money down the drain. So we know that now stress lead to a lot of diseases, including cancer, and it can be it can be overcome by various means. In fact, if you look at the non-communicable diseases, basically it's like we have put the infections, almost like a two-thirds of uh, can be linked to unmanageable stress on individual basis. So it's a paramount that when somebody treating, somebody in family having an issue to address that component because otherwise it's really will going to come back over and over again and causing tremendous difficulties to individually as well as to the family. So emotion effects clearly affect the health, but sometimes emotions are happen in day to day life. We we come across things, we people score at us, some quarrels and families argue. Again it's perfectly okay to disagree. No need to take that as a personal basis and raising your blood pressure. At the end of the day, you are the one who's going to suffer, not the person who caused you to stress. So you don't want to end up with getting blood pressure high and end up with stroke and go to hospital for no reason. Right? So think, think carefully. I mean, think back and say that why, why could, why couldn't have ignored that stress because he or she is uh, calling me. So what? But you know that to a certain degree. Many circumstances, you'll be surprised that we can ignore those things. If we ignore repeatedly, you think that that person is going to continue to stress? No, he's going to be on. He's going to get stressed now because he tried multiple times to hurt you and you, you should have just laughed at him. So that person is going to be up eventually. So he's the guy the person who's going to, he or she's the guy the person who gets stressed, not you. Not your problem thing. So let's talk about a little bit the medical point of view, what stress does us. So stress activate three key hormones in the body, stress hormones, what we call them. So in those excess production of stress hormones lead to affect actually every cells in the body negatively. It actually decreases the functioning of the some of these organs, including the brain, brain, heart and the kidney. So our body is going to get affected because we're not managing our stress properly. And also this uh, endocrine system and the hormones, uh, excessive production hormone affects see all these stuff I you know in the bottom, bottom of the slide. So these are not fun. We are actually creating problems for ourselves, which could be decreased significantly. So this slide summarizes basically on the endocrine system or the hormone producing glands in the body right in the middle and shows how it does affect the system, body system. For example, adrenaline comes from an adrenal gland. So as a corticosteroid, glucocorticosteroid from that adrenal, adrenal cortex. Those are the two key hormones which causes sustain, sustenance of the stress. So if, if I divert the attention a little bit, uh, you probably have heard the thing called the uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. How many of you have heard that? PTSD. Some people have heard that. PTSD is uh, very well studies uh, entity for soldiers going to war and coming back with a mental stress. But oh, there's a very study that the vast majority of the two thirds or even more than the two thirds of the people in the world get PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, not linked to war issues. Due to violence, robberies, accident, acute health issues, those are very stressful events on an individual basis. So those can cause uh, acute stress, but some people it means nothing. But uh, others, it's a major stressful event, and they cannot get over it for a long term basis. 
So these people, what happened actually, you get a, instead of getting higher corticosis, it's actually uh, adrenal gland gets suppressed due to internal stress. So they are not appropriately responding to glucocorticoids, but unfortunately, the adrenaline and noadrenaline level, the stress hormone, the sky high and remains high. They are not supposed to be remain high. Go to a stressful situation, it goes up, you either run away or fight. That's what the adrenaline is designed to. So flight, flight response. So on the other hand, what happened with these guys is this is remaining high of these two hormones, which causes a tremendous amount of uh, the stress within the brain and actually it's reshaped the brain to modulate the brain to its size in certain components and actually structurally changes the brain. It can be demonstrated by the MRI technology, for example, if you have MRI. And interestingly, the, there are several studies from US, uh, three universities now have shown that meditation, using, mostly by using the monks, the monks who have been dead for 30, 40 years, showing that exactly opposite of this, this monk's brain, that this particular stress area actually shrunk very, very small compared to the you and I, or certainly for the people who are coming from the wars and uh, PTSD, which are much, much bigger. So, important thing to realize that those are, though, even though these people have a larger areas of this, uh, the hippocampus and particular areas of the brain, that can be restructured again through the stress relieving mechanism. And meditation is one of the simplest things can do to reverse that structural change back to, back to normality, which we never thought 20, 30 years ago, which, which you could do. So, so these are the three key areas in the brain, the hypothalamus, both are part of the brain and then adrenal glands which just for the kidneys producing all these uh, bad hormones, stress hormones to maintain the stress level. So let's look at very briefly both emotional health and physical health separately and how we could try to improve by living having a balanced life. Nutrition is part of the balanced life clearly, so avoiding the smoking and alcohol is part of that too. And the taking the life on positives way rather than the looking at the glass half empty kind of thing for the time. Negativity always pull you down, that the positivity will always helpful for the immune system and for the body function. So you can also incorporate a certain degree of spirituality. Basically, spirituality is, is not a fancy word is basically the behavior, <coughs> the right behavior. As you know very well with the, the, the Pancasi, the first five precepts, that's where the code of conduct is going to So that's part of the major part of the spirituality is to follow those five precepts. It can change somebody's life dramatically if you follow them. How many of you follow them? Think about it whether you actually do all five consistent fashion on the day to day basis. Then think about, if not, why not? Why am I not doing that? Then you think about it, how can I improve so that if I'm doing only three, can I make it four this year? Maybe year after I can do all five. Can do that? Of course you can do that. It's all here. It's up to you. individual person to do that. But simple change of life based on the spirituality, the spiritual belief can make a tremendous difference to you, your family, and the entire community. Because your community becomes peaceful, there are no more drunken people doing bad. Just for example, I mean, it can be, have a tremendous effect on the long term peace and sustainability of our community. So, what happened to the other extreme, undisciplined or uncultivated mind? So, mind is like a, a monkey in your mind and jumping from one to the other, all bad things. Because you, you continue to bombard it with the thoughts every every minute we might get several dozens of new thoughts coming in and goes out and you don't retain most of it. But if you think about it, just think about it, five seconds, number of thoughts you go through your brain. So many. It's like a like a machine. Continuous ago that so the uncontrolled mind, the amount of thought process going through them out and beating them one at a time and Eventually, you you know what's the bad thought is coming. You should eliminate them at the at the very beginning, and then come to your thoughts and think about it, 
and then so basically you're eliminating the bad thoughts to much as you can with the develop from your mind. Whereas the other in the disciplined mind, the mind had developed through whatever means of meditation, the spirituality, the good thinking, whatever it is, is a calm mind. It doesn't like it's not rough. See that you basically maintain your think thought process and you get bad thought, but you identify them early enough. This is a bad thought and you should be able to eliminate them very quickly. Rather than the untrained mind or uncalm mind. You are thinking about the bad thought, oh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to destroy that person, this person, I'm going to rob them, nothing. You think about it, but as a calm mind, trained mind, bad thought comes, you know exactly what's coming and you should be able to make them come right at the beginning. So you don't even spend a second on that, that kind of thing. So that what I could do actually to, let me, let's do a one or two minutes little exercise. We could create something now. You, everybody has got a pen and a pencil, right? That. I'm not going to ask you to write a story, just simple thing. Right. Close your eyes and write your name on that paper. But not looking at it, just close your eyes and write your name on that paper. Alright, you can open your eyes then. Now think about what process went through when you're writing your name. Now you're not looking at it. You're mentally thinking about it, right? So that's a that's the process we're trying to develop on mindfulness. Simple as that. Nothing magic about it. You are mindful of what you're doing. Whereas if you're writing uh, your name while you're looking at it, you can talk about you being the cell phone, can you find different things. But you're not mindful. You're not putting attention to any of those who you know, might be asking. I do that all the time. Tell different thing I can do. But this is the simple basis of mindfulness. You, you, the task we are doing at it, whether you are having a cup of tea or writing your name down or talking to somebody over the phone, if you are mindful, your error rate could be much, much less. It may not, it may not be zero. But the development mindfulness start with the concentrating on what you do. And that karma. In other words, in, in Buddhism we call the living in the current moment or present moment. So all those things together, but this simple exercise actually show you that the task you did just now, you're writing the name without looking at it. You couldn't have done it unless you focus what you're writing down. Right? If you never thought of anything, just write you want to write somebody else's name, maybe you just scribble. And when you look at it, it's unreadable, then obviously you're not focusing your mind. Your mind is the best well. And then if you're able to write from now, when you go from the beginning, if you're able to do that, then you're actually able to, even for that few seconds, you'll be able to concentrate your mind on, on, on the task. So the, the goal for meditation, for example, um, to strong summarizing through just two or three sentences, is uh, not only during the mindfulness, which you had experienced now, but apply that to day-to-day -day activities. That's the key thing. So just because you're meditating 10 minutes and the <coughs> next 24 hours you do bad things, then you're not actually applying what you learned, what your mindfulness to the day-to-day -day life. When you're driving, when you're doing a task or doing a project, uh, whatever project you are doing, if you're mindful, then you're actually concentrating right up to that task we're doing. So then the children, at any exam, for example, if you're mindful and able to control your focus during that one hour, two hour in the test, they'll be pretty able to finish very efficiently in half the time of that when allocated time because their mind is not dumping from Australia to what they did last night or what they were going to do next morning, that kind of thing. Our mind is very fragile, goes all over the place. So again, I want you to think about it. I mean, this will not be the right time, you know, at a time, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. How that can be applied to your day to day activities. Simple, start with a very simple thing making a cup of tea, and drinking tea or coffee. Thinking automatically without thinking versus uh, mindfully drinking. 
again, it's, it's, it's not a pressure to do that, but if you do that, then you'll be able to automatically build your skills to be mindful of the activities you're doing. So if you're mindful of the or if you're mindful of the activities you're doing, would you do bad things? You go and steal somebody's wallet or kill somebody? You're not doing it. Now you know that you're mindful, you understand that you're doing things right or wrong. Whereas you do do like a routine, like a parent speaking, you don't think about it. You just do and then later you think about, oh my god, I did a bad thing. It's too late. So that's the beauty of the mindfulness. The whole idea of mindfulness is to apply, learn to deal with mindfulness, apply to day to day activities, second to second, so that you will <coughs> stay within the social norms and if you do the right thing, look at the chance of getting stress out of that. Very low, right? Almost none. On the other hand, if you're not mindful and you do bad thing, you're going to get stressed, accumulated. Somebody will cause problem. Such a simple, simple as that. I'm putting the simplest way of uh, you know, how the mindful works for you on <coughs> a longer term basis. So, with that, as uh, Buddhist meditation, and you're talking about the living at the present moment, you are aware of what you're doing now at your present moment. Right now, you're listening to what I'm saying, but at the same time, you'll be able to think whether what I'm saying is useful or not. Can I, can, can I apply that to my life, your life, now, tomorrow, tonight, that thing. That's the important part. You, you need to be able to think, positively concentrate, and see whether you can apply, even for five minutes, for ten minutes, even three times a day, whatever it is, simple thing. Do that and see how you can do your activity with time. Let's move on to the meditation itself. And very briefly, I'm not going to teach you meditation. <coughs> for the time to do that. But I want to talk about the, the effects of meditation and uh, how it affects the health and well-being of all of us. So the interest in the meditation and the medication words uh, arise both from the Latin word medicus, to care, to cure. So that's very interesting and it's, kind of, it's not a coincidence, it's actually very important to understand that. So, question is how the meditation affects individual basis or shift our priorities. Clearly, it's, it's helped you to be living in the present moment, which means you are very unlikely to do negative things, bad things, and chances are you, whatever, whatever you do is more productive for you, your family, and your workplace. So, you need all productive, positive things. <coughs> So basically, meditation also doesn't arise in the vacuum. It also comes with a certain degree of uh, spirituality. You have to have an understanding of right from wrong. Meditation it does not exist by itself in somebody with a criminal mind, for example, and very difficult to put that person to even for five minutes or two minutes, one minute, thirty second meditation program because the mind is mind all over the place, mind thinking about how to harm you, how to harm somebody else. <coughs> so on the other hand, if somebody is practicing five precepts, three precepts for example, any any religious precept doesn't matter what it is. So you have a baseline of under underlying spirituality already. It's a matter of questioning how you as an individual put that into practice. Whether you lie to somebody for criminal activities, for drinking alcohol and getting drunk every night. These are individual things. Every, every, every religion in, in the world has, has teaching about these things. Even though people are interpreted differently, but every, every religious leader has said these are the good things to do. So think about how you can adapt that to your own lifestyle on a day to day basis. That eventually, if you time, maybe six months, six years, it doesn't matter. Eventually, you, your life, your, your, your subconscious mind, be engulfed with this precept for spirituality. So it becomes a routine part of you. You have to think about it, whether you do the right thing or wrong. When you are done, you have to think about so many times. You practice that, it becomes a routine thing, just like your baby. You don't think about your baby. Right? It happens automatically. Similarly, if you know from the right from the wrong, always the right will come automatically. As soon as the wrong thing comes, you 
as I said before, your negative thoughts coming in, you should be able to filter, identify them in pretty well in seconds. So these are the kind of things you, as an adult, as parents need to be, I won't say to teach, but to give by examples for children to learn the way you behave and they can adapt the right behavior for, for their future. So, meditation actually is not a religious thing, it's a very good in U.S. The meditation is one of the fastest growing trend, almost growing almost like a three or four percent a year. People doesn't adapt or become Buddhist, but they, they become Buddhist to learn meditation. So, they know the value of meditation, but we don't. We know the value of meditation, we don't care. Most of these things. So we are Buddhist by name or by birth or whatever. So we take it for granted that's good enough. But if you want to become successful longer term, to be good for you, good for your family, good for your community, these things can really help you to your, your internal mind and the peace. So when you meditate, clear your mind, mind become calm. Maybe not the first few weeks, maybe not for the first few months, you have to practice daily basis. Long time, your mind become calm and calm. You don't get disturbed with the thoughts. You don't get annoyed with somebody calling your name. Because you know how to deal with these things. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to practice. Keep practicing. So with that, your inner peace and inner relaxation will come automatically. You don't have to think about it. And ability to concentrate could be better. You can solve the problems. The kids can go and do the exams better now. And uh, technical problems, the technical people feel the issue will do that more efficiently now in the shorter period. Because now we can concentrate, focus, and get the job done the shortest period. So, overall, it improves the emotional stability, the internal peace, and your intuition to do the right thing for right reasons. So, meditation improves multiple things. For example, awareness. So awareness of the current and the surroundings certainly improve concentration, no question about it. These are the few other things meditation does on a deeper level with the practice going on, going on forward. <coughs> so there are a lot of uh, recent over the past 30 years or so, there are a lot of research has been done on meditation. Again, as I said, we're mostly using the Tibetan monks who have been meditation for six, seven hours a day on a long-term basis. And as I said, their brains part have shown so, so different from non-meditative people. There must be something structurally and functionally happening on a long-term basis. <coughs> so the, the other side of the story, actually, you are just stressed, you are angry all the time, Clearly, I mean, there's no brainer that it's going to affect your performance. It's going to affect your productivity. It's going to affect your peace within you, within the family, and between individual people as well. So again, this idea is to break that vicious cycle, become less stressful, become less angry. Hopefully, you can build on that long, longer term to become more peaceful and productive person for the <coughs> community. Let, let me skip this one too much detail. Now, so let's look at the physical benefits. So that those are the emotional or mental benefits. Now, what about the physical benefits of stress, uh, meditation? Now, again, studies have shown that clearly reduce blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, that means you're calm within, so that you don't have to breathe fast, you your heart doesn't have to pump too fast because you're not too excited. Less anxiety and get hospital, because you know how to not to get your stress into your system, you know how to weed, weed them all. With so there are several things like that uh, improve fairly quickly. In fact, uh, in my, my, my own medical practice, uh, I've been practicing now for 40 years, and I always tell people, my patients, on, on not religious medicine, just very simple techniques of self relaxation and mental isolation, things like that. Many of them, and also, where I'm practicing now, there's a couple of teachers from um, Zen medicine teachers. So, certainly good. They're both professors in, in happen to be in English, actually, in the professors and the professor. They teach meditation three times a week. So I send my, some of my patients to attend those classes as well. 
to be surprised that uh, many patients be able to get rid of almost all the medications like blood pressure medication after about a year or two they don't take it. And they are shocked. I was shocked, I know that's going to happen, but the patient actually said, I don't have to need any medicine. I said, sure, you don't have to see me again. Either. You don't have to come back again because you're now out of that particular type of stress, you know how to manage the stress through medication. Just continue that. Cost nothing. So there are a lot of things you can do on an individual basis or even group basis to improve their lifestyle and, and the health and mental well-being. So emotional benefits, uh, also those are known for brain, that you actually become a kinder person, a compassionate person. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through the list, but these are the beneficial things you will automatically develop with long-term regular meditation practices or some kind of relaxation practices, whatever the thing you want to do. Again, this is I'm not talking about the specifically religious based meditation. You can any kind of meditation relaxation would, would help you. So when you develop a lying kindness through meditation thought process, you will become more charitable, you become generous, you help each other, your neighbors, your family, and people suffering from other countries. And that compassion will become a positive vicious cycle. So when you develop the positive vicious cycle, you become internally happy. <coughs> and that internal happiness will end up as a <coughs> serenity. People will recognize that. You don't have to tell other people that you are a serene person, you are a happy person. This is automatically visible to any animals. So, the next one I'm going to talk about is the thing called uh, one minute meditation. How many of you have heard of that? Uh, I have a series of meditation books I published a couple of years ago, and one of those books had a few chapters on one minute meditation. But I'm going to go through that because this is one of the things you can do yourself while at work. Very simple. So we basically, um, we accumulated most of our almost 78 percent of our stress is at work, whether we like it or not. That's that's a general uh, consensus. The workload, the colleagues will not listen to you. The subordinate doesn't work what you do, and your supervisors not. Whatever it is, whatever the reason, you accumulate your stress. To the end of the day, you are exhausted. You're coming back with a bag of stress in your mind. Then you shout at your spouse at home you have your kids, unnecessary. They don't, they don't deserve that kind of behavior from you when you go back home with your stress. Ideas that you do when you finish your work at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, whenever it is, you leave the stress back at work. You should go home same as you came out of home. Does that make sense? Like, you, in other words, you don't have absolute no, you do not need to bring the work back at home. So this is a simple technique you can do to avoid that happening. It's really simple. So every hour at work, every two hours, whatever you want to do, take a minute or two for yourself. I do this routine because I work, I used to work at an extremely successful environment, that kind of stuff going on. So I want to refresh myself several times a day to face the next bowel of stress, which is so that it doesn't matter. Like so, take about two minutes, and uh, the simplest way to relax at the work environment is to take a couple of deep breaths. The Indians, Indian system <coughs> called Sanaya, it doesn't matter what name you use. If you, if you take two or three deep breaths, you, you feel relaxed. It's not meditation, it's, it's just simple visual, basically. You improve your oxygenation, you relax your muscles, and you only have to two or three deep breaths. And then close your eyes and think about what happened in the previous hour or two hours, depending on that. So you, you know that if you had a stressful situation, you identify that immediately. Then think about it, what, how it happened, why it happened, how can I avoid it. Because you don't want to bring that stress to the next meeting, next project, or next uh, advisory meeting or something like that. You basically think about it and eliminate it and that particular time. So if you do that, Imagine that we do it eight times a day, just eight minutes. 
Why did that fire occur? You have nothing. You stressed your mind to bring back home. That was what happened to that eight hours straight. You bring, bring it up. You are taken back home and you are an angry person. Unnecessary. You have to do that. So you can eliminate that very easily by doing these kind of very simple things. So, just one minute an hour. Sure, every hour we can afford to do that. But that benefits so in practice and see that the benefits are tremendous. So these are the kind of visible benefit you will feel within the first two weeks of doing this one. So you really to idolize your energy, so you are facing the less tasks with the fresh blood now, fresh breath of air. So I'm going to do a practice of meditation. I mean, you can do it yourself. And uh, if there's kids out there, like how to do that. I think you can skip that. But here's the advantage of this uh, one minute meditation. <coughs> so as I said, you minimize your day to day stressors. And the last thing you want is to take stress home. Please don't do that. It's bad for you, bad for your family. So you can eliminate that by this simple technique. Just practice. Again, it's not a one straightforward thing, it will be different. Then do it one technique. And you will do it one technique very quickly to do this kind of a practical procedure on a daily basis. So, again, imagine that you're really spending eight minutes or ten minutes a day. This is for you. You have your mental health, your physical health, and your family is very busy. So, I think it's fully worthwhile spending eight to ten minutes during the work time for <coughs> but it goes to all of all of us. <coughs> so end of the day basically you will be refreshed, you'll be happy if you're working out of the office. So when you come home you will be a pleasant person for your family. So we all need this kind of a stress, simple methodologies, practical way of relieving the mental agony, stress stimulation to improve our mind-body interactions. So what's the connection between the health, wealth and diseases? Does the wealth will bring you happiness? No. So the wealth will improve your health status. Up to a certain degree, yes, because you can go to better doctors, better hospital, and get a heart transplant, whatever it is. You know, all short term stuff. But in general, wealth brings nothing. Sometimes it's a misery. That doesn't mean the generation of money is a bad thing, it's a good thing as long as you do the raising funds and generation of money on the ethical issue. Sure, absolutely. But what happened is, uh, more than 50% of the population generate funds for the economy but screwing somebody else's, you know, either compromising somebody else's, selling bad products or, or selling the bad insurance, knowing that it's a bad thing to do. Whatever the means, they could make money, or making some dynamite, so can somebody sell it to the kid. All, all, all this has been documented very well and selling most of the surplus in the in good sense. So the first 50, 50, 40, 50 years in our life, we work so hard to make money, all of us. But we forget our health. Many of us become not healthy by between 50 to 60 years of age. Think about your friends and colleagues, mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts, make the same, same mistake. They work very hard in the first 50 years, and by the time 55, 55 60, they have multiple medical issues. They neglect themselves, but their focus was on creating money. So, what happened the remaining half? You now get made a wealth, now you're going to spend all that money to doctors and hospitals to keep yourself better. So, this is a vicious cycle by the time we realize that children is too late. So, this is another area really be useful for you to impart this kind of message to your younger generation, children, particularly, and middle age. Adults, 20s, 30s, and 40s, because they don't understand this. You didn't understand that. I didn't understand when I was 30s, this principle. 
the mistakes that we do. But it's nice that you can invite this kind of very simple message to them to have a balanced life. So to have the optimal <clears throat> when you have the optimal health, you actually increase your happiness, your inner peace is your optimism. It's a big thing to have it. You cannot find inner peace no matter how well you are, it's impossible to do that. You can only develop within yourself and nobody can even meet you. So it also practical point of view, when you have the inner peace and you're happy, you actually face less errors. That's nice to have less errors. You know, construction the uh, hundred floor building or collapse or some surgeon doing the operation and uh, if it just bless us the less patient will be dying. So all these are good things you can do that. And end of the day you can have a more happier family as well. So in addition to the good nutrition, balanced diet, exercise, relaxation and if necessary some medical health. There are other things you to optimize your lifestyle and the inner happiness to your inner happiness, which you can buy. Again, it's very important for us to teach our kids, younger generation, that happiness is not equal to wealth. Nothing to do with each other. In fact, they're totally two, two different parts to look at the most senses. But most of the wealthy people in the world are very, very unhappy. And they die, they get in trouble and start drinking. Interestingly, also, there's a report from the US, the people who lot, won the lotteries, maybe it's a birth. Virtually 95% of them would die prematurely. They won $50 million and die in five years. <coughs> it's true, at least historically, that there was a the nice payback. Somebody came down and going back backwards because suddenly earn millions, they don't know what to do. Majority will start drinking, smoking, all kinds of bad things because now they have money, they don't know what to do with it. Rather than giving to other people, they try to use them. You have 10, 20 million, it's impossible to spend that in your life. No way you could spend that other than spend some stupid money, boats and houses, I think. By spending on day to day activity, it's impossible to spend that kind of money. In your lifetime, that means you don't need it. So instead of that, these people who suddenly earn money for millions of dollars, they they get from that and gambling, particularly you know, gambling at the number two, cause of death. <coughs> and there some people lost 30 million, 40 million in a two years, they become a death suddenly. So this is the problem with uh, this cycle of money as well, because you don't know what to do, you don't know how to handle it, and that's created negative vicious cycle of stress and lead to major problems. So money also cannot purchase happiness. No matter what people say, it's impossible and there's no connection between the two. So what do we need to learn? So we need to have two kinds of education. Firstly, one that teaches us how to make a living. Which we are you all are doing very successful, that's why we are here. We make money. We're happy, that's it. And the one that teach on how to live in daily life, that most people are not doing well. That's why right. one point you can, I can, you can improve on the second part really. Because you have to have a balance between the first one and the second one, have peace and daily life as we discussed. So, bottom line, we have to have a strategy for developing a balanced life. Making money, how to utilize it, how to make peace within in the family, at work, within colleagues, and how to make our contributions to the society, whether it's family, at our work, or at school, the best we can. We have obligation to do that as human well. beings. So uh, we, are, we are privileged being a human being rather than a dog or a cat or somebody else. Whatever you have to people who doesn't have it, make their life better. That makes them happy internally. <coughs> so happiness comes automatically rather than you are pursuing for your happiness, which is impossible to do. Fantastic presentation.
question I want that this came to my mind. Many of you describe about this adrenaline gland in our body. Uh, now we have we have this uh, fast uh, moving uh, high speed roller coasters. They advertise and they say adrenaline runs at very high. Uh, does this has some impact on our special needs when we travel on those? Um, is it a, it's a good thing or not? That is, is a great question actually. Uh, the, the way to look at is actually is, is somewhat somewhat similar to our day to day life when we look at work, for example, at school. Because our stress level has never been very steady unless you are a meditative monk in the forest or something like that. Or unless you are developing mind so high levels, you don't you know, get a stress into yourself, you just pass it away. So, getting that kind of excitement and stress level with the freezing adrenaline and corticosteroid actually peaking up when you're jumping 100 feet down below or roller coaster, it, it, it certainly causes uh, in changes in your physiology and pharmacology, you no know, question about it. But those are not sustainable. The key is to temporary stress versus sustaining stress. There's a major difference between the two, not, not even comparison. So there's no data to show that scientifically having that kind of uh, stress, acute stress, short term, for, for good or bad reason, has a long term negative effect. <clears throat> there could be physical problems, like something getting uh, the neck damage and uh, those uh, scopes are trying to get hurt. But uh, there's no data or there's research showing that it has a long-term bad effect. Except that people, there are small percentage of people, just like alcohol, smoking, drug, people get addicted to that kind of stress. So uh, the kids go into parks on a regular basis, uh, and the other thing is actually people, children in particular, the teenagers getting used to violent, uh, uh, violent, uh, what do you call it, electronic games, they are getting addicted to that. So that causes sustained stress and they clearly go to support their brains on a long term basis. So we have to be careful with getting vocational excitement versus some very frequent excitement, just that getting used to uh, drinking alcohol daily. Now you do three times a day you have a glass of whiskey. That means you're clearly addicted to that alcohol stimulates your brain to function to a certain level. So that's the difference uh, uh, you have to uh, think about it. And even for your children, if somebody's asking them every day to go to every weekend to go to the park, you have to think about are we doing the right thing or something happening there and is getting out of control. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Any other questions? US compared to back in the round, but we did not move to US. 
and the heart rate was almost at 2.4 percent higher heart, heart attacks and strokes were higher too. So something is changing for this group. Same population, same time. If you age much more than you are to back in here, back in the US where I was in New Jersey, now, huge uh, in a community. A lot of studies have been done to show the difference between the two. What is difficult to dotted line, connect the dotted line is this, what, what causes that? Is it due to the diet, change the environment, atmosphere, or the unmeasurable stress level? Stress is very difficult to measure, measure and quantitative. Right? So I personally believe that stress has tremendous impact and uh, there are people who disagree with me, uh, it's nice to disagree, but the problem with stress is actually we can, cannot measure. There's no instrument for quantification to measure and say that you have a 10% stress or 30% stress. But the people who know they are really stressed. Um, I have tons of fun in your patient. They're all stressed out. I don't know why. Um, it may be that they can't even know how to speak English and uh, they can't go to anywhere where in India they can go anywhere and they have their multiple language, they you know, they're very good at home. In the US culture, they are very strict, they don't want to do it. They cannot go out, they are in the community, there's no social atmosphere, they're stuck at home, basically. So that made them to very much less activity, no exercise, eat bad food, junk food, and they become obese, insecure. Because fat, intravenous fat is the number one cause for heart attacks and strokes. So, they are not doing that, they are doing that because nothing else they have to do. Stress situations is that according to the negative vicious cycle, what we are talking about, just like a stress, different forms of stress. Yeah. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.
So I want that country, I want this country, I want to have made some difference to, so that I can make billions. So that's the problem. They are, they are mindful on a different level. But there is, there are, there is zero connection between the spirituality now. You see, they have been bringing together to be a useful person for the community.